What's up, metal and heavy music fans? Today we are ranking the albums of Blut aus Nord. All right, we got a lot of albums to talk about today, and we're going to start, as we always do, at the beginning with Ultima Thule in 1995. Very just sort of traditional black metal record, raw aggression paired with icy, spooky synths and some ambient sections. Would, again, compare it most closely to a mix of, like, early enslaved, sort of like VV and Frost, and then also some Ulver mixed in there. Decent for what it is, a little dull and unfocused overall, though, and also... This just isn't really Blut aus Nord for all intents and purposes. I want to meet the person who says this is their favorite album and ask them why. Because to me, that's like, is to entirely miss the point of this band. So I am going to put this one at D tier. Not bad, but just not really what I'm looking for. It brings us to Memoria Vetusta 1, Fathers of the Icy Age in 1996. So the first of a trilogy that is going to span several years <laughs> at this point. Um, still very much in their early phases here. Very traditional black metal. Same comparisons, but maybe with a little bit more of that kind of like folky side of things. And this series in particular kind of sticks with that. Sons of Wisdom, Master of Elements, The Forsaken Voices of Ghostwood, Shadowy Realm, and really a lot of these feel like they would have been right at home on, again, like Viklin Ligerveldi or, you know, albums of that ilk. Very Scandinavian sounding. And again, actually pretty solid for a traditional black metal record. And within that realm, if I were reviewing it, I might have given it like a B, maybe even like an A minus or something. But it's just, again, not what I come to Blute Aus Nord for, and considering how far they've progressed from here, it needs to be a bit lower by comparison. I'm also going to put this one at D tier, but just a little bit higher. Next up, though, is the Mystical Beast of Rebellion in 2001. And so this is them kind of moving more into their sound, a bit colder, more stripped back as well. That previous release had some warmth to it in the folky influences again, but this one is more of a blast beat driven slog through just absolute misery. Like it's like a cold wind blowing through every crack and crevice of your home. And strap in for that because it's what you're going to get from start to finish. Like honestly, speaking as a mental health clinician, I would genuinely not recommend listening to this if you are in a bad place. Like, legitimately. I'm not joking. Starting to hear a little bit more of their own personality again setting in, but not fully formed yet. I'll bet there are those out there that absolutely love this album, and it does seem to have a bit of a following, but I'm not really into the, like, super depressive side of black metal, so it's a purely personal taste that this ends up a bit lower for me, and I just don't find it to be quite as interesting. So a little bit higher, but C tier feels about right for that one. But then we have the seminal, the work which transforms God in 2003. So this is like the first definitive Blute House Nord album. If you look at like fan rankings and reviews and things like that, incorporating a lot more of that industrial and dark ambient stuff that they would become known for over time. This shares some of the DNA with Mystical Beasts, but much more dynamic and refined, sort of takes some of that foundation and then adds some early god flesh to it, I would say, and I get a broader scope of emotions from it, even if they're all still pretty negative. Like, this is harrowing, eerie, unsettling stuff, and you get all these subtle variations of those things. Like using a movie example, I would say something like the last album is just Martyrs, which is also French, <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, and this one is like Hereditary or The Lighthouse. Fantastic atmosphere all the way through, and strangely engaging given the approach, too. Like, there's a lot of kind of negative space utilized here, things tend to be a bit stretched out, but I was never bored. Love the touch of those terrifying howls in the background of metamorphosis, like souls falling into hell. And speaking of which, on that note, I barely even noticed that a lot of this album is actually instrumental. It's just that good. Our Blessed Frozen Cells gives like a brief ray of light, but definitely mostly darkness here. That's just a nice little one for contrast. Definitely a fan favorite and the highest rated on Metal Storm at this point, and I tend to agree. I'm going to put this one at S tier. We follow that up with Mort in 2006, and this is an acronym for Metamorphosis of Realistic Theories, expanding on the previous album again, this time seeming to double down on the eeriness and scale back even more of the harsher elements. It's also far more freeform in its virtual abandonment of structure. There's lots of 
very creepy, alien-sounding, bending guitars set to industrial beats. Vocals once more are sparing, and when they do show up, they are often held back in the mix, like really buried in the background, so you have to like strain to listen to. Sometimes seeming to come from all directions, too, in eerie mumbles and whispers. Others just blood-curdling screams in the distance, as at the end of Chapter 4 and the beginning of Chapter 5. Very spooky kind of survival horror music with a little bit of a bad acid trip rolled into it. Great bit of background music. Not the first album I'd pick from them if I was in the mood, but definitely unique and interesting stuff and more of the style that I do enjoy from them. I'm going to put this one at A tier. Then we got Odin is the Destruction of Reason by Illumination in 2007. This one kind of rides the line between the last two, but doesn't feel as interesting as either, in my opinion. It's, it's 36 minutes though, so not a bad listen, but this one feels like full-on background music to me. I have very little to say about it because it's sort of a repeat of what I said about those albums, except not done as effectively, in my opinion. So I'm going to put this one at C tier. All right, that brings us back to the Memoria Vetusta series at number two, Dialogue with the Stars in 2009. So already like a big gap <laughs> between the first and second in this series, going back somewhat to the sound of their early albums, which again, they do periodically with this particular group of albums. And I'm coming to realize that some people really do prefer these albums, which kind of surprised me. I just sort of assumed most people preferred the more like industrial ambient stuff, but there are some people who genuinely like these more. And that's weird to me because I see the whole draw <laughs> as they're more unique and avant-garde stuff. But as always, it just comes down to personal taste. So y'all let me know down in the comments, which do you prefer from them? The more kind of traditional folky style black metal or the more avant-garde, industrialized kind of stuff. Now, all that said, you can hear a lot of the elements they've been developing up to this point also seeping into it, and the fusion leads to some moments that are actually quite lovely, like the acoustic at the end of Disciples' Libration, or the soaring harmonized guitars on the Cosmic Echoes, which is not something you're generally going to get somewhere else. Great atmosphere overall, but especially thanks to the spacey synth work. Still not a go-to album for me if I'm in the mood for Blute Aus Nord, and also feels a bit over long at just shy of an hour like I can't deny its beauty and grandeur but I'm also bored in places where it drags which I'm sure others would say about the albums I like but that's why I always make it clear that this is just my opinion and it's the difference between our takes that makes music so fun and interesting to talk about. Regardless an undeniably strong effort that definitely improves on their original formula and if you love atmospheric black metal in particular this will be right up your alley. This is actually of this series my favorite of the three. I'm going to put it at B tier. All right, now we come to the big trilogy opus of 777, starting with Sex in 2011, and that is Sex, S-E-C-T-S, -E not the other one. So again, the nice thing about the Blue Dots Nord discography is that there's always something around the corner that may be right up your alley, even if you don't love the present album. And with this trilogy, it's back to that dissonant and industrialized stuff that I like so much. It opens with another miserable spiraling chasm of descending tremolos and blast beats, then transitioning to more minimalist electronic drums and spooky whistling ambience, opening up then into this plodding cavernous space that seems to echo on into eternity, and then back again into the blistering flames with Epitome 3. It's like one continuous nightmare escape, and just like in our dreams, we're constantly getting this whiplash as we jump from scene to scene without like a clear transition. Another album I describe as Lynchian, and I wouldn't be surprised to find out that David Lynch listens to this band. Yes. Not my favorite of the series, but good stuff. I'm gonna put this one at B tier, pretty high on B tier. And we continue directly into 777, the desanctification in 2011. And again, these are meant to be kind of like one continuous through line and you can listen to them back to back. So this picks up basically right where the last one left off, even implying as such by continuing the number scheme starting at seven. This one reminds me a bit more of Mort in its dedication to eeriness and droning ambience, which makes sense because like that album, these three were written entirely by Vinceval. Fewer eruptions of aggression maintains a more consistent volume. There are some more notable passages of guitar melodies, but that's not generally the focus here. Epitome 9 reminds me a bit of 10,000 Days era Tool in a weird way. I love the clean 
vocals too on 10. It's sort of like a hypnotic mantra to go along with this track's more meditative vibes. Alternatively, I also dig the simple head bob inducing pulsations of 11. Regarding the concept, this record is supposed to represent the exact moment of monumental solitude following the disownment of God, one that is followed by the endless fear of your remaining thought patterns. The distress of an orphan face to face with the morbid breath of the universe. That is a direct quote, and I think they nailed it. I'm going to put this one at. A tier. And then we close this trilogy with 777 Cosmosophy in 2012. I think this may have actually been the first Blue Dust Nord album I listened to all the way through, so, you know, better late than never, I suppose, because I've definitely got a lot of albums that I kind of missed out on and had to circle back to over the years. And I do find that one or two people always respond to that with some snarky shit in the comments, but, like, y'all, there's a ton of music out there. You gotta recognize, like, for every discography you've heard all the way through there's way more that you haven't so just you know give people the opportunity to explore things that's what this channel is all about not everyone can catch every great band from the beginning all that matters is that we find them when we find them and we enjoy them together in any case i think this is the best of this trilogy and a powerful conclusion it takes everything they built out with the previous two and matures it to absolute perfection. Those opening dueling guitar lines on 14 are just so beautifully sorrowful on their own with all that reverb. Then those layered clean vocals come in like they're announcing some profound prophecy. More of that also on 16 and it's just blissful candy to my ears. I'd even say that this feels like the most well-suited style of vocals for the music as well. Speaking of which, I also think this was a big influence on Shamash's Triangle, which came out about four years later and is another modern favorite of mine. Just brimming with emotion in every single note, absolutely stunning. Then you've got that quiet, chilling French spoken word section on 15 erupting into basically a full-on symphonic arrangement seemingly out of nowhere. Speaking of which, I also think that this is some of their strongest production to date. It just It's just massive, <laughs> is, is the only way I can describe it. All around, just truly haunting and even, like, transcendent sounding stuff. Perfectly paced, perfectly orchestrated. You can probably guess where I'm going to put this. It's S tier. And then, having finished out that trilogy, we circle back to finish another trilogy in Memoria Vetusta 3, Saturnian Poetry in 2014. So I'll admit, in my re-listen here, after reliving that masterpiece, it was hard to transition back yet again to their more traditional roots. I still hear some of the leftover DNA of 777 woven into this one, but it's still just an entirely different thing overall. True to the contrast in their cover art, 777 feels more like interdimensional and otherworldly, whereas the atmosphere here is much more grounded in nature. More of that Bergtat, Borknagar kind of feel, which I like, but again, this is not my favorite version of that. Again, triumphant, yes. Massive, yes. Competent, yes. Interesting to me, not exactly. I find this very repetitious. Honestly, it puts me to sleep a lot of the time. Metaphor of the Moon is pretty rad, though, and Clarissima Mundi Lumina makes for a great closer. Again, this is the final in the trilogy, though, and I'm sorry, but I'm kind of thankful for that. Again, of the three, two, like, this is, is not one of my favorites. I like the second one better. I'm going to put this one at C tier. Then we got Deus Saludus May in 2017. I compared this one to Godflesh's Street Cleaner and Gnaw Their Tongues when it came out. Also, some allusions to, like, the Quake soundtrack, the original. Also shares some DNA with the previous year's split with Evangelist called Codex Obscura Nomina, which I also really enjoyed. Fantastic drumming just seems to crumble everything around it, reverberating the entire listening space like cold, heavy steel machinery. Warbling guitar effects that conjure a fever dream of strange alien dialects. I love the Middle Eastern uulated chanting buried in the mix. The whole thing just sounds like being inside of some smoking mechanical death machine. Like you can hear all the cogs and pistons struggling to churn. Tracks like Impius, Ex Tenebre, Lucas, and Apostasis, which I'm saying all wrong, <laughs> sound absolutely evil and demented regardless. Then there's the big lumbering doom vibes from Abysme. Some people seemed to be pretty lukewarm on this one, but it definitely plays to my sensibilities and also at just under 34 minutes, it's really hard to go wrong. I give it an 8.7 when it came out and I'm going to go ahead and put this one at A tier. 
Then there's Hallucinogen in 2019. This one's almost more in line with the Memorial albums in some places, like more repetitive and atmospheric on tracks like Nomos Nebulium. Also feels a little bit more freeform and jammy at times. A lot of these tracks like Nebeleste and Sibelius sound mid-career enslaved again with the folky chanting and kind of psychedelic guitars big atmosphere. Mahagma just sounds like a giant waterfall with a rushing torrent of drums and guitar. I like it, but I don't love it. It feels a little bit unfocused and without a clear direction. And I'm interested, though, to hear how they kind of further refine this sound over time as they have with others in the past. So I'm going to put this one at B tier. And that brings us to Disharmonium, Undreamable Abysses in 2022. Now bear with me, we're going to get very metaphorical here, but it's definitely in keeping with the themes of the album. Chance of the Deep Ones definitely has a very Lovecraftian feel to it, befitting of the title, and appropriate to that, those creepy warbling guitars and the pulsating bass now sounding like the alien language of Elder Gods alongside the constantly tunneling effect of the blast beats. Tales of the Old Dreamer was the first taste we got of the album and offers equally great atmosphere, which is just magnificent across this entire thing. I get a pretty similar effect as this one as the opener, but this time as if the creatures are now in movement and lumbering over us at massive scale. The reverb and melodies at times also conjure imagery in my head of cloaked cultists enthusiastically sermonizing at their arrival. Into the Woods gives us a brief but still eerie reprieve with its ambient opener before haunting us with distant minimalist guitar leads like drifting phantoms, later joined with beast-like growls and the persistent beat for an overall effect that makes me feel as if I'm fleeing in slow motion. With Neptune's eye then picking things up a bit again with layers of effects soaked guitars now seeming to rise and rise, scanning to the pinnacle of this behemoth only for it to disappear seemingly endlessly into the clouds. That Cannot Be Dreamed opens with a very interesting effect that sounds like shorting electricity, and speaking of which, I continue to be amazed at just how differently Blue Dust Nord continue to approach their instruments to produce such interesting noises. And the mixing around the very subtle vocals is so distant and wispy as to sound more like a cold wind rushing through. Kazaya Mason settles back into more of a doomy space with the bass slowly oscillating up and down to the simple head bobbing beat. And for those unfamiliar, Kazaya Mason is an ancient witch and the antagonist of Lovecraft's The Dreams in the Witch House. And then we close with the apotheosis of the unnameable, which put in simpler terms seems to be exploring what the the ultimate culmination of something truly indescribable might sound like, which is a concept Lovecraft has also explored, except generally more in regards to sight. In any case, I think it is the perfect conclusion to highlight just how difficult it is for me to describe this album without resorting to completely non-musical comparisons and imagery. I'm just gonna say it. This is a masterpiece. Seven tracks, 47 minutes, and I was utterly captivated by every second of it. Once more, it's too early to pit this against my other top two picks, but I feel no issue at all with putting this one right alongside them at S tier. Check out this playlist for more black metal videos and tier lists, including a recent one on Deathspell Omega's discography, and let me know your favorite album down in the comments. But that'll do it for now. Flight of Icarus signing off. I will see you in the trenches.